Be in prayer. We are, uh, I think you all know that uh, Kathy's got an eye problem. She's not trying to disguise herself with the sunglasses. She doesn't see well. She can't see out of her left eye. Uh, then last night, they, uh, we got a call from Ohio. They took her mother to a hospital. Uh, and then this morning, uh, as I speak, uh, her oldest sister's husband is being killed by Barack Obama because he's in a hospital in California where he is being denied health care because he's 68 years old. And they said the health care bill, because of that, here's all we'll do for you. So, uh, you know, that's, how's that for a vote for murder? But... Um, Anyway, so on that good note, <clears throat> all right, uh, you guys know what checklist Christianity is? You know, that's where some guy sends you a form. I pity missionaries, you know, they get these forms, do you do this, how many hours of a week do you knock on doors, uh, how much do you read your Bible, how many tracks do you pass? Uh, some of them, you know, uh, what does your wife wear to bed? You know, that's really nobody's business. Yeah, it really isn't. How big is her tattoo? You know, that kind of stuff. Uh, and, so, uh, and so we're pretty much down on checklist Christianity. I'm going to talk to you this morning about the importance of checklist Christianity. I believe checklist Christianity is of God. And I'll prove my point, or at least I'll make my argument. You don't have to agree and be wrong. Um, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, look what the Lord says, verse 5, examine yourselves. If you examine somebody, don't you need something to check it against? When you're doing examination, don't you have a standard by which you have to check it, correct? I mean, when somebody sends somebody this, this little form saying, uh, how do you check this box, yes or no, this box, yes or no, this box, yes or no, they're saying this form is my standard, do you meet my standard, Correct. All right, he says, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. He says, you might not even be saved. So how do you find out? Examine yourself. Now, I know we all say, well, don't judge me, don't judge me. That's the mantra of America. You can shoot somebody, be standing there with a loaded smoking gun over their bleeding body and go, don't judge me. Well, then judge yourself. Examine yourself. And I'm going to talk to you this morning about examining yourself with the checklist. Actually, actually three checklists. Uh, it says, prove your own selves. Know, not, uh, know you not, uh, your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you except to be reprobates. Now, I'm not one of those people that tries to get uh, save people lost. You know, try to shake them, uh, make them think they lost their salvation, get them to pray a prayer that they prayed 20 years ago and actually meant it back then, uh, and then chalk it up as another retread. I don't mean that at all. But you were instructed by this inspired book to examine yourself, correct? Correct? Then there must be a checklist by which you can examine yourself. Here's the problem. The problem isn't checklist Christianity. The problem is who's writing the checklist. And if you're going to let some guy write it, you know who he's going to end up? He's going to end up being God. Because basically, he wants to find out if you do as much as he does. And if you look in this, all these little boxes you're supposed to check yes and no, you're going to find out that he's got them all checked properly. I don't think anybody ever made up a checklist, ever, ever, ever said no to any of their, uh, uh, their checks. And so feel free to throw out the checklist. I had a, I had a, a meeting some years ago scheduled with a pastor in Pennsylvania, uh, he'd been a student of mine, and, um, and he, had to, he left that church. And so he thought, oh, man, I'm going to leave a hole in Gip's, uh, uh, his schedule. So he called another pastor who I didn't know, and, uh, and, and, and he called me, and he arranged for me to have this meeting at this guy's church. And so I called this guy up, and he, I said, uh, Pastor so-and-so, I'm Sam Gip. I understand you want uh, that week, uh, such and such week. And he goes, oh, but you have to talk to my secretary. And I said, why is that? He said, well, she's the one that sends out the form. And I said, what form? Well, <clears throat> nobody preaches in my pulpit without filling out a form. I said, well, I'm not filling out any form. You could hear the silence, you know, because I'm supposed to be going, please give me me, please me, please give me me. I just, uh, at least throw some crumbs. And, um, and I said, well, I'm not filling out any form. And the guys didn't know what to say. And he said, uh, well, nobody preaches in my pulpit without filling out a form. I said, well, that's fine. I said, that's your prerogative. I said, I said I'm not filling out any form. And the guy just didn't, he wasn't ready for that answer. And so, uh, and so finally he goes, uh, well, I'm not letting a divorced man preach in my pulpit. And I said, I'm not divorced, pal. And then I said this. I said, how about we make a deal? You don't send me your form, and I don't come to your church. 
You know, I'll tell you something, guys. I found out that, that five ugly minutes over the phone beats five ugly days. And, and so, you know, it was going to be some kind of a checklist. But the Bible says we are to examine ourselves. Then there must be a checklist or two or three. And I, there may be more. I can find three in the Bible. We're going to look at the biblical checklist, all right? And I'm not going to judge you. You're going to have to judge yourself. Go back to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And the, un the unfortunate thing about judging yourself is you can lie to anybody, but really, if you, can, if you believe your own lies, you're really in trouble. Isn't that true? There are, there are three lists in the Bible. Now, I have to use a word that I don't like to use because this word has now been perverted. But there are three progressive lists in the Bible. Progressive. I don't mean this uh, come in on a skateboard, preach from a plexiglass pulpit, uh, sing on a screen. I don't mean that, that perverted progression that the contemporary churches have. I don't mean that progressiveness. I mean progressive is you go here and then here and then here and then here and then here. You have watched progression in the, in the development of your children, have you not? I mean, they crawled, then they got in a walker, and they walked around a little walker, and then they got on a scooter, and then they got on a tricycle, then they got on a bicycle, then they got in a wheelchair. <clears throat> but there was a progression, all right? And so there are three that are not, they are not, these lists are not something like when you get saved, you get all of these but that you, you get this one, and then this one, getting this one straightened out and, and handling it right, takes you to this one, which takes you to this one. Look at what it says uh, in Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> and, and I have to say, I believe the Bible, even though I'm not sure it's correct when, it, when I read this, says, look at verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also. Okay, stop. How many of us have proved that verse wrong? Oh, Wonderful. We're going through tribulation. We're having just the greatest time. Whoopee. Anyway, uh, it says, We glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. So those are a progression. Take a look at And here's the question. Here's the question. Uh, the first thing. Verse 3. How do you handle tribulation? Everybody's going to have tribulation. I don't understand this, you know. Well, I just don't understand. I'm saved, and I'm going to church, and how come my car isn't getting good mileage? And how come my garage burned down? And how come this had to happen to me? Well, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are that you should be insulated and inoculated uh, from the troubles of this world? Everybody has those, do you understand? And so we are all going to enter tribulation. If, if you are dumb enough to think that there's some, some magical potion, quote a verse, uh, or, or you're going to have some invisible force field that's going to keep all tribulation out of your life, you're on drugs. Or at least you ought to get on drugs to excuse that stupid thought you had, okay? At least they, you could justify where it came from. Guys, we all have tribulation. So that's not the big deal. The big deal is what do you do with it? How do you handle it? And, and this, I'll tell you, one of the, well, the, the, predominant, uh, the predominant character in this list is your relationship with God. Who brings tribulation into our life? Yes, absolutely God. Don't say the devil. The devil couldn't do a thing to Job without whose permission? God's. And so it is God. And so how do you go on? Look, man, if you can go through tribulation, your tribulation is, I mean, you're grieving. You're wringing your hands. You are having a major problem. You don't know how this is going to turn out. You are in pain. And you can say, God, I, I give you the glory for this. You're, you're, you've not made, you've not made you know, top progress. You're just starting. Because this is the beginning. Tribulation is the beginning. And if you're going to sit there and go, I don't ever want to go through tribulation. All right, two words. Grow up. Grow up. And that is, what, that is what progressive growth is. Isn't that true? It is growing up. So how do you handle tribulation? Do you glory in it? What, if you handle tribulation properly, it leads to the next step. What does it say, tribulation? Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Let me say this about this patience. This is patience with God. You know why? Who brings tribulation into our life? Who? God. Then, then one of the first things you want to do is not gripe to him about your tribulation. When you can be patient with him, as the source of your tribulation, you have, you have really taken a big step. And so you have to be patient, have patience with God. Now, I'm going to tell you, I, I don't mean this when I say I'm on your side like God is not. 
But I'm on your side in that I don't want to hurt. I don't, I don't want to be sick. I don't want to have a fire. I don't want to bury a kid. I don't want to lose a job. I don't want to have a, a problem with my sons or kids, okay? I mean, I'm with you. I understand. You know, you can say, well, you don't understand what I'm going through. Listen, I, you, know, you, I may not have gone through what you've gone through, but we've all gone through some kind of tribulation, have we not? You have to be patient with God. You say, what does that mean? Don't go out behind the barn, shake your fist at heaven, and, and just give God down the road. Now, surely you have done that at one time or another. I always tell people, look, we've all done that. Haven't you ever done that? Have you never gone and just said, you call this love? You say you love me and this is in my life? You've never done that? Because if you haven't, maybe you've never had tribulation. It's okay as long as you go out behind the barn the next day and go, I was kind of stupid. <laughs> Thanks for not sending the lightning bolt. Maybe it's like, um, God, I'll tell you what, I, I won't even get mad about this time because, because here's the problem. After you have enough tribulation, you start having patience, and sometimes you find out what God was doing. He was watching out for you. He was trying to steer you. And so you, ju you just got to be patient with God. <clears throat> so tribulation, work with patience. Look what happens. Patience, experience. Experience is a wonderful thing. Young people don't have experience, nothing personal. But you've got to go down the road a ways to have experience. Do you remember, you guys have been saved for 20, 25 years. Do you remember things early in your, in your Christianity that you went, oh no, what are we going to do? And then 25 years later, something bigger than that happens. You go, oh, no problem. We've seen this before. Right? You say, what is that? That's experience. Did you ever watch young people? I remember I was teaching this college and this kid comes up to me, one of my students. He goes, this is back in the uh, 1800s. Anyway, um. And this kid comes up to me and he goes, he comes, run up here. I come walking into my class and he goes, he goes, we're dry, we're not drinking Pepsi anymore, are you? You know, conviction to the month club. And I said, I don't know, well, why, why aren't you drinking Pepsi anymore? Haven't you heard? Obviously I haven't. Well, Pepsi had just, Pepsi-Cola had just made some kind of a deal with a vodka company in Russia, and they were going to market Pepsi-Cola over there, and Pepsi was going to market vodka over here, and, vod and, and, this, and Pepsi had, had said, we're going to put a, uh, a bottle of vodka on every dinner table in America. That's what this guy said. He said, they're going to put a bottle of vodka on every dinner table in America, so we're not drinking Pepsi anymore. <laughs> I said, are you drinking vodka? It's going to be right there. Well, what do you think? I said, well, they're not going to put a bottle on my table. I said, they're going to put a bottle on your table? No. I said, well, that's two of us. But see, here's the thing. See, this kid saw a threat to all of Christianity over that. I'd had enough experience to take that and go, kid, if that's your problem, you haven't got a problem. Right? And so, so that's what happens. You get tribulation, tribulation, you get patient with God, then you have experience. Now, come on. Some of you, you know, you have gone through some greater tribulations late in your life that, that when you went through a lesser tribulation when you were younger, almost derailed you, almost got you bitter at God. That's a good thing, guys. You have grown some. And what, what does experience lead? It leads to hope. You know what hope is? Here's what hope is. Listen, the difference between faith and hope. Uh, if, if they put you in jail, you say, I have faith God is going to get me out. Right? General faith. I have faith God is going to get me out. Then your lawyer comes in and says, we're filing papers Thursday afternoon, and if the judge okays them, you're out Friday. Now you take that general faith like this, and you focus it on, this is my hope. Do you understand? This, my hope is that this paper gets me out. And so you begin to have hope. So, guys, <clears throat> one of the checklists that you should check yourself out. Uh, here's what I'm asking you. Have you evidenced in your life uh, after tribulation? I know you've had tribulation. If you haven't had tribulation, you are dead. You aren't alive if you haven't had tribulation. How did you do with patience with God? Did you say some things to God you shouldn't have said? And I'm not even going to judge you for that. I'm just going to tell you you ought to be smart enough to go back and say, I'm sorry. You know, I tell God this more times than I want to count. I've said, God, I don't appreciate what's going on in my life right now. Then I finish it with this, but don't worry, I know who's wrong. 
It is not wrong to disagree with God, especially in things going on in your life, as long as you know which one's wrong. And the nice thing about dealing with God is it's always us. Well, that's true, but that way I don't, see, I don't even have to suspect that I might be right. Because if I might be right, I've told God this. I said, God, I know you can't be wrong, but I said, if I get to heaven and find out that you could, I think this was one of those times. <laughs> Last time I prayed that prayer here is what I said. I said, God, I, through gritted teeth, I don't really appreciate what's going on in my life right now. And then I said this, but don't worry, I know who the idiot is in this picture. Me. You have to be patient with God. So what am I advising you? I'm advising you next time you go through tribulation, watch what you say to God. Watch how you feel about God. Curb your anger toward God. Not because he will judge you, beat you, do something else, but because that, if you can't get that in, you've got to keep going through tribulation and recycling until you get the next step right. So when you can handle tribulation with patience, then patience brings experience and experience hope. And many of you got far more hope in the Lord taking care of you than you did 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago from going through tribulation and patience and experience. Uh, turn the page. Look at chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Look at verse 16. <clears throat> and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, <clears throat> for the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of, of many offenses unto justification. Oh, I'm, I'm reading verse uh, chapter 5. I'm sorry, chapter 6. My version reads different than yours. <laughs> there actually is no chapter 6 in my version, but it makes for faster reading, I must admit. I bet I had some of you wondering, didn't I? Okay, let's try chapter 6, verse 16. Know you not? Uh, that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. All right? He says, you yield yourself to, obede to obey somebody. You are their servant. And I know some of you say, well, I'm not serving anybody. You'd be shocked at who you really serve. Now watch. Whether of sin unto death. Now that's not talking about the sin unto death. That's talking about yielding to sin, which leads to death. Okay? This is not talking about the sin unto death whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. All right, then the first one in this one, the first check, how are you with obedience? How do you do with obedience? You know, I, I, I am amazed at us. Sometimes we'll go, uh, especially young guys, I'm sorry, but it's like this, it's like this. Oh, God, tell me what mountain you want me to climb. Tell me what ocean you want me to cross. And he never wants you to climb a mountain. And he never wants you to cross an ocean. I will guarantee this. I will guarantee everybody in here, you can remember when God just wanted you to cross a room. When he just said, see that guy over there? Go give him a track. You see that person there? Go talk to him for me. Can I tell you something, guys? If you won't cross a room, you won't cross an ocean. If you won't climb the steps of the house down the street to tell somebody about Jesus Christ, you aren't going to climb any mountain for God. Yeah, we like the glory of crossing an ocean and climbing a mountain. I mean, there's just really not a lot of glory. I crossed a room today. I climbed steps today. I mean, unless you're 95, that's not a real big accomplishment. <laughs> How are you at obedience? I had this happen. We, were, we, do, we, we do time in truck stops, you know. We have to pull in for fuel and, uh, and, and food. And I'm, we're in this truck stop and I'm walking out. And... Uh, uh, and, and, and for some reason, I mean, I'm about to go out the door, and I, and I look across this, this large area, and there's truck drivers all over the place, and, and God points out one guy reading a newspaper, black guy reading a newspaper. And he said, go give him a track. So I walk over to him, you know, the guy's got his paper, he's got his nose buried in the paper, and I, I stand in front of him, I say, excuse me, this guy don't want to be bothered, he's reading his paper. And he goes, Yeah. My wife has something to tell you. <laughs> I said, uh, you truck driver? He goes, yeah. I said, well, first, let me say, I know that everything I got, I got because of a truck driver. I said, I know the clothes I'm wearing got delivered by a truck driver, the, uh, the carpet on the floor. I said, everything we got, I said, I appreciate what you do. I thank you for your job. And he smiled. He said, well, thank you. And I said, and listen. I said, while I was walking out, I said, I'm a preacher. And while I was walking out, God told me to come over and give this to you. 
I mean, that's the truth, isn't it? And I handed it to him, and I turned to walk away. You say, why didn't you witness to him? God didn't tell me to witness to him. All I know is when I look back over my shoulder, he wasn't reading his paper. Uh, guys, how are you at obedience? So, <clears throat> look what it says here. Look at verse 17. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, uh, that you were the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. All right, then here's what I want you to think about when it talks about obedience. How are you with doctrine? Are you obedient to doctrine? Now, we're real good with checklists on doctrine. Do you believe in salvation by grace? Check. Do you believe in baptism after salvation? Check. Do you believe in uh, eternal security? Check. Do you believe in the, the premillennial return of Jesus Christ? Check. I mean, we're all really good with doctrine. You know why? Because generally it doesn't affect our life. I, I, I really would be surprised uh, if there was somebody here who had a doctrinal problem. But you do have to have that right. So you have your biblical doctrine right. Do you have your moral doctrine right? Oh, oh, wait a minute. Look, if I passed the paper today and said, do you think that murder is, uh, you know, killing people is murder and that you shouldn't murder people, you'd say, oh, yeah, you shouldn't murder people. Uh, and, and then when your granddaughter needed a, an abortion, you found a way to justify it. You know, a lot of people think that abortion is murder until it's one of their family and then it's just an easy way out. You know, a lot of people think that homosexuality is an abomination to God, but, but this is our son, you know, and we still love him. Well, stop it. I am so sick of mothers, Christian mothers going, well, you know, Junior, you know, he's gay. He's not gay. Quit using a nice word to describe a horrible thing. If you ever saw two of them in action, gay would not come to mind. Perverted would come to mind. Sick would come to mind. Abomination would come to mind. Queer would come to mind. Right? And if you're offended by those words, it's because your real preacher and the God you're trying to please is a television camera, not the Lord. I cringe when I hear Christians talk about homosexuals and they say, well, the gays. Why do you call them that? Because your television demanded you do it and you bow your knee to your TV every day, especially when you're t checking the tent. And you know what some of you mothers ought to tell your perverted sons and daughters? You tell, you tell your perverted son... Meet him at the, porch, uh, at the porch at the front door, smack him across the face and say, don't come back until you lower your voice two octaves and you can say S properly. <laughs> but you think homosexuality is bad until it's your kid or your friend. You think that murder is bad until you want to get rid of a, something that embarrasses your family. How are you in obedience to moral doctrine? Obedience. What does obedience lead to? Oh, look at this. It leads to salvation, or it leads to righteousness. Look what it says in verse 18. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. All right, then righteousness comes from obedience. I can think of two people in the Bible that were called righteous. I look at, uh, keep, keep your place here, but look at Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7, that's right after Genesis <clears throat> chapter 6. Look at verse 1, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy family into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Do you know what that generation was like? That generation would probably be embarrassed if they found out what our generation is doing. Isn't that right? I mean, are we as close to the days of Noah as you can get? There may be a couple of things we haven't picked up on yet, but trust me, we'll fill in all the rest of the blanks. You know what I advise people to do? If you don't know, if you don't know how to live for God, why don't you find out what the world is doing and disengage? I know you're all going to watch TV. It would be good if you shot them, okay, your TV, but you're not going to do that. You're all going to watch it, but... But you know, I say this, if you've got a favorite program, why? Well, I just want to say, why? Well, you know, I'm all, I, I can't believe people actually cry over a TV program. You watch some guy get killed for his 95th time. And, and you're worried about who's going to win Dancing with the Stars? And who's going to be the next American Idol? 
Guys, I'm from Ohio. That's where pro football got its start. I like football, man. I like football. I told you, my hometown, Maslin, Ohio, 33,000 people. Our high school stadium seats 26,000 people. 26,000. The first pro football team was my hometown, Maslin Tigers. They were undefeated for like seven or eight years. Until uh, somebody started the uh, second pro football team. <laughs> Just when you got a good thing going, you know. And, and you know, I want to see uh, the Ohio State Buckeyes win. I was, uh, we were up in the, we were up in the, uh, up in Alaska in this little village, decrepit little village. And I saw a bumper sticker that said, my two favorite football teams are Ohio State and whoever's playing Michigan. Good man. And if Ohio State wins, I'm excited for about five minutes. And if they lose, I'm upset for about five minutes. You say, what happens after five minutes? You forget it. It's a stupid game. And don't talk to me about any of the players. I don't know who the players are. I don't know what their careers are. I don't know what their stats are. What are we doing literally submerging ourselves in a world that, that we know is God's enemy, that the Bible says if we're friends with it, we're an enemy with God? So Noah was righteous in this generation just by simply not being like them. And I know you say, well, I'm not like them, but Romans chapter 1, all we talk about is the homosexuality of Romans chapter 1. But, but look, take a look at Romans chapter 1. And look at this horrible generation. Look at verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, Democrat, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, despiteful, uh, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Isn't that a unique one to have in that list? Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. You say, oh, that's bad. Look at the next verse. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such, such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And so you watch that crowd on your television and you let you give yourself to them to be entertained by them. Why don't you disengage? Why don't you miss your program? Why don't you, who cares if the detective dies? Who cares if they find out that he killed somebody 40 years ago? I, who cares? It's not even real. And, and our lives are surrounded or, 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 or involved on, in that. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, the other people that are called righteous. Verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea. Of Judea. A certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was the daughter of Aaron, uh, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God. How? Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Can I ask you a question? If you are death on checklist, is the Ten Commandments not the original checklist? I mean, really, if you think about it, is that not really the original checklist? Are you not supposed to look at the Ten Commandments and ask yourself, have I taken the Lord's name in vain? I don't mean cussing. I mean claiming him as your God and Savior and then, and then telling the jokes the world tells and listening to their music and saying the same thing when you get mad just like they do. Taking his name in vain does not necessarily mean you got mad. When... It just may mean that you say that you belong to him, but you don't change anything about the outside appearance. How about lying? You violate that one? Lying? How, man, guys, that is the original checklist. So keep the commandments and the ordinances. Go back to Romans chapter 6. You start with obedience. That leads to righteousness. Righteousness leads, verse 19. I speak after the manner of men <clears throat> because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity, unto iniquity, uh, even so now yield your members, servants unto righteousness, uh, to righteousness unto holiness. Uh, you know holiness is not women wearing beehive haircuts and ankle-length dresses. Though it is an improvement over probably what some of you wear during the summer. Ladies, I'm talking about. How about you guys? But... Um, 
Well, I've always said this. I think some women Christians, I think some Christian women, they, they ought to burn their summer wardrobe. It wouldn't be much of a fire. But, it, but everybody would be better for it, okay? But guys, here's the thing. There ought to be some semblance of holiness in us. You say, what is holiness? Holiness is that which you do to impress God, not man. What did you ever do? What, do you, what did you change in your life? What did you alter in your behavior? Because you said, I want to impress God. That's holiness. Do you understand? We have a holy God. You know what, the, you know what politicians do? If they're talking to the farmers, they talk about what they're going to do for farmers. If they talk to the steel workers, do we have, still have steel workers? Anyway, uh, if they talk to steel workers, they tell them what they're going to do with the steel workers. And they talk to the union, they tell what they're going to do for the union. You know what they're trying to say? They're trying to impress them. Here's what I'm going to do to impress you. What is the last time you said, God, here's what I'm going to do to impress you? That leads to holiness. Man, I'll just bet you, I'll just bet you, if you really said, God, I want to make sure that I impress you with everything I do. It change some of the things you listen to. It alter what you say. It it stop some of you th- the funniest jokes you've ever heard. It stop you from telling them. Guys, I can remember jokes from when I was lost that I still don't tell. Okay, you say why? I don't care what you think. I'm not trying to worry about. Oh, dude, could you believe Gip told? I know God wouldn't like it. And when, when our behavior is guided, guided by how is, what is God going to think of me, that's when you're getting close to holiness. Now, I want you to notice these first two checklists are all between you and God. Can, you understand? It's all how you end up with God. The third one is, is if I can say this, humanistic. Look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. Because we are on this earth, we do walk this earth, we do, we do commune with one another, we do have to engage, inter, interact with our fellow man and fellow Christians, correct? Correct? Okay. Then there's going to have to be a checklist on how we treat each other. And I'll tell you how you know that these checklists are of God, because there's three of them and nothing is repeated in any of them. Nothing overlaps. Now there's going to be a word used in this one that was used in, in chapter 5 of Romans, but I'll show you the difference because they are two, the same word, but, but they're both applied in a different way. Look at verse 5. And beside this, give all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. All right, then what is faith? Well, faith is trust in Christ. That's where you start, is it not? Didn't you start with an act of faith? Now, if you haven't had that act of faith, you're not even saved. So you start with faith, and what does that lead to? That should lead to virtue. What is virtue? Virtue is our power to do good. You, uh, you know, you, you get these people that uh, they're, a moral, they're a moral force. I'll give you an example. I can't remember what this guy, who that guy was, that he was head of some anti-homosexual deal, uh, and he stood up and condemned homosexuality, and then found out he was queer. Now, I don't think, I don't think that happened. I think he was a plant. I think he hid it until he could become the head of that so that he can embarrass all of us into never fighting against homosexuality. But, but, but can you imagine, you know, here's this guy talking about how bad homosexuality is and his words have force. Do you think his words had the same force the day after they found out that revelation? Uh, this uh, John Edwards, you know, this uh, I love my wife so much even through her cancer and he's shacking up with some woman. But doesn't it look so good, you know, and he gets in, now see, you just have to be true to your wife, even through these hard times. And everybody goes, wow, what power, what virtue. And then you find out that he's with some other woman and got a kid. And suddenly those words are hollow. Do you understand what happens when you lose your virtue? That's what we call hypocrisy. When, when, when all you've got is righteous words, but no actions, all you've got is righteous words. So what you need is you need virtue. Faith leads to virtue. Virtue leads to knowledge. You need some knowledge. Uh, I've said this. Americans quit using their brains the day after they got their TV sets. Most of you don't use your brain anymore. Use your remote. You wanna know, if, you wanna, if you wanna get an opinion, you just watch this, this the 40, uh, 48 hours, 2020, uh, 60 minute special on some given subject, and at the end of it, you think you know what because you said the same thing they wanted you to say. They programmed your thinking, you come away agreeing with your television set, and you thought that you thought. You never think, and then when you do, you were wrong. I would question any thought I had while I was holding a remote. Really. Any idea that ever came to you while you were holding a remote, 
stop and think, you know, I think somebody just programmed me. Somebody snuck one in. All right? And your whole problem is you think they can't sneak one in on you. You're so proud you don't believe you can be fooled. You know, what we, you know where, why we fail? Because we don't like to admit that our enemies are smarter than us. And if not smarter, they're better at what they do than we are. They're better at deceit. They're better at, at manipulating people. Isn't that true? You need some knowledge. What, is, what does knowledge lead to? Verse 6, and, knowledge, uh, to, and to knowledge, temperance. It said temperance. You know what it didn't say? It didn't say balance. I love this thing. Well, God believes in balance. Why, would, why do we ascribe an attribute to God that God doesn't ascribe to himself? Isn't it funny in the name of balance when everybody's allowed? Can I prove to you that God does not believe in balance? Isn't balance 50-50? Well, you better go out and recruit 50% of this church as homosexual so we can have balance. <laughs> no, thank you. Well, you better make sure you're 50% Democrats and 50% Republicans because we want balance. God wants balance. We better got eight perverts on the ark because he had eight righteous people on the ark, don't you think? I mean, he believes in balance. Isn't that what balance is? God doesn't believe in balance. You know how I know? Because when he put up the tabernacle, at the back of the tabernacle was the Holy of Holies, and there was a curtain. And there were, you know how many panels there were in that curtain? Eleven. Now, wait a minute. If you have five and five, they meet in the middle, correct? So you have five and five, but you know a curtain that meets in the middle, it could open up a little bit. You ever be in a motel room where they used about one inch, not enough material in the curtains? <sighs> you know what you want? You want it to overlap. So you know what God said? Make this one five wide and this one six. So that when they came, they didn't come like this. They went like this. You say, why? God, God will take imbalance to preserve holiness. You are not supposed to be balanced. You're supposed to be temperate. And that is our problem. That's why you shouldn't have a favorite TV program. You should miss it sometimes. Be a little temperate. There's nothing wrong with honey. That's what the Bible says. But too much is bad, right? You've all heard it. Too much of a good thing is a bad thing. Isn't that right? So give me your money. Anyway. <clears throat> But let me ask you a question. Are you temperate in anything? Do you throttle back anything? Oh, I love it. I love it when people say this. Well, you know, we're going to drop the Sunday night services, you know. We're just going to dial back a little bit and rest. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, cut God off in the name of temperance. Yeah, the only thing you throttle back on is Christianity. The only thing you restrict is what you're going to do for God. Don't you dare. Listen, don't you dare ever use that book against the God that wrote it. You would do well to miss a football game. You got a season ticket, miss a game. Miss the big one. I know this is going to shock you. You'll wake up the next morning breathing. I, I was, uh, was watching a game. Ah, oh, it was this guy's. It was you guys, Boise. Remember that, that years ago, a couple of years back, that, that trick play? We're staying at my, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law's house in Ohio, and I'm watching that game, and my nephew is watching it, and, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm enjoying the game. I like football. And I was rooting for Boise. I mean, you always root for the team you bet on, you know, anyway. Um, <clears throat> and my, and my, my nephew, he likes football, he's watching, and I get up to go to the bathroom with 15 minutes left in a game, or, or for five minutes left in a game, whatever it was, and I come back out, the lights are out, and he's asleep on the couch, and I realize he's waiting for me to go to bed, so he can go to bed. So he went to bed, I didn't see that play. I never, I heard about that play the next day, and I went, oh man, I missed it. You know what that means? Nothing. That means nothing. Guys, come on, why don't you miss one of the good times the world offers? Quit grieving over the good time you missed. God was doing you a favor. Be a little temperate. Now look at verse, look at verse um, 6 again. And to knowledge temperance and temperance, patience. Now remember I told you none of these overlap. None of these are repeated. But patience was mentioned in chapter 5 of Romans. But remember I said it was patience with God because who gives us tribulation? God, you need to be patient with God. This one is not about patient with God. This is patient with man. So how do you know? This whole thing is about, is about our relationship. It ends up with brotherly kindness and charity. This is our human one. We need to be patient with men. Are you patient with each other? So how, do you, how am I patient with somebody? Don't be quick to talk about them on the phone. 
Don't be quick to spread the gossip. Don't be, don't be quick to spread the bad news. I, you'd believe, you'd believe how much bad news I hear a month or two after I knew it. You say, well, why didn't you tell anybody? It's not my job. I'm not the evil reporter. I am, my job is not to carry every bit of bad news that I hear. Do you understand? And guys, we need to be patient. Somebody makes you mad and you're off. And then that afternoon you find out that they were misquoted and they really didn't say that about you and now you got to go back and retract. Why don't you be patient? Are you patient with men? Can somebody actually commit the unpardonable sin, which is to disagree with you? Could somebody actually commit that and you not kill them? in the name of Jesus. What does, if you can get patience with man, what do you end up with? You end up with godliness. Do you know what godliness is? Godliness, I define it this way, God-likeness. If you are godly, the more godly you get, aren't you more godlike? Aren't you more like God? Right? right. So what is God like? We will not go there, but you can go there on your own. Write down jo uh, Jonah chapter 4, verse 2. Five attributes of God. Jonah, you know what Jonah's, now look, if you ever, do you know what Jonah gets mad about God? He goes behind the barn and he shakes his fist at heaven and goes, you're so gracious and merciful and of great kindness. Whoa, 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 this doesn't sound right. God is gracious. Are you gracious? Say, what is gracious? Grace is getting something good that you don't deserve. Have you ever given somebody, somebody, somebody something good that you didn't think they had coming? Have you ever been merciful? You know what merciful is? Merciful is not getting the bad you know you got coming. Have you ever known something about somebody and you could have put the gun to their head and pulled the trigger and you chose not to because you were merciful? What was the last one in that list of Romans chapter, chapter 1? Unmerciful. I don't want to be at the mercy of someone who has no mercy and that's what we're going to see in this generation. But it is natural for us to be unmerciful. It is that Bible that makes us supernatural. Do you understand? We are naturally unmerciful. This book intercepts us and, and makes us something more than nature, supernatural. That's why we're going to have a whole generation that's unmerciful because there's no more Bible in our generation. Are you ever gracious to somebody? Are you ever merciful? Are you kind? You know what kind is? Kind is when you do something for somebody and you get nothing for it. Wasn't that Jesus when he's picking up a bunch of kids? He's not running for office. What does a kid do? Nothing. They don't vote for you. And until recently, they couldn't carry a gun. And so it's like, why do you hold this kid? His, his disciples said, leave him alone. He said, let him alone. Let him alone. I like kids. He's not getting anything for it. He was just kind. Now, our politicians, they don't pick up a baby unless there's a TV camera around. Are you kind? Are you long-suffering? Are you long suffering with somebody that makes you mad and then they make you mad and then they make you mad and then they make you mad and they make you mad? And they make you mad? Are you long suffering? Do you repent of the evil that you plan? Come on, surely you thought about doing something to somebody at some time. Have you ever been just, you got on your phone and you're just about to tell somebody something about somebody and you said, you know, I think I won't do that. If you ever did that, God bless you. If you vomited out all those things you knew, Go back to the beginning and start over. And godliness, brotherly kindness. I, I'll be honest with you. I, don't, I really do not know what brotherly kindness is. I, um, I had a brother. <clears throat> he was two years older than me, and there was no brotherly kindness. My brother and I hated each other. That's not a joke. We fought every single day. I have one living relative, my sister. She is six years older than me. And we were talking, and, and, and she just referred to my brother. And she said, boy, you guys fought every day. My brother and I hated each other. Absolutely. We, we just did. I don't know what brotherly kindness is. When I see brothers, man, it just thrills me when I see brothers. And they act like brothers. Gee. When I see sisters, and I, I, get in, I, I get in some of these churches, and there's like a, a bunch of sisters together and a bunch of brothers together. I'm talking about flesh and blood and they're nice to each other, I am thrilled. It just, it just does something for me, man. I just think that's really something so foreign. But guys, we're supposed to have brotherly kindness toward each other. And you say, well, how do you have brotherly kindness? You start out with faith and you get to virtue. You're not going to, see, here's the problem. If you don't have those first kind, brotherly kindness and the next one, charity, become some righteous act that you do. Well, I gave to the heart fund. I marched for the cure. 
you, you get brotherly kindness, which leads to what in verse 8? Ch- or 7. Brotherly kindness, charity. There's a whole chapter on charity. Charity isn't uh, the heart fund. Charity isn't the cancer fund. Charity isn't the salvation army and the goodwill. But charity, you know what? You know the difference between pity and charity? You can feel sorry for somebody. You can have pity for somebody and never get involved. Charity is when you hear about something that, that, and you go, we got to send them something. I, I got to see what I can do about this. I got to see how I can make something different in their life. Pity is, oh yeah, isn't that too bad? I mean, look, there, there are people that I pity. And there are people that I have charity for. Amen. You cannot have pity for, you cannot have charity for absolutely everybody. And what the, what the news media has done is they've taken our, our, our valid charity and they've made it so that we have to have it for AIDS patients. I am sick of seeing some pimple guy with uh, his teddy bear dying who worked hard to die. I don't even have pity. I'm sorry. I don't even have pity. I have, I have pity for the one that went to the dentist and got it because the dentist was a homosexual and unclean. But also, I mean, there's nothing to get involved in. But guys, how are you with charity? Okay, there's got to be an end. All checklists have an end. What is the end? What are the growth benefits to you of these three lists? Romans chapter 5. Hope. The end of that, of that list is hope. What does that do for you? Less stress. Right? right. By the way, you do understand that stressed, sp- stressed, Amen. spelled backwards is desserts. Think about that. Anyway. Amen. <laughs> but really, if you got hope, you have less worry and less stress. Isn't that true? Because when some tri- tribulation shows up, you go, been there, done this, haven't been through this particular one, but I, I remember the hopelessness, I remember the panic, and now I don't panic anymore, now I have experience, and I, I, now I have hope. So there's less worry and less stress. Could you use a little less worry and less stress? I'm sorry, it's not in a pill, it's not a prescription, and it's not, you know, uh, 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 you know listening to the Wave CD going, Ooh. Ooh. It's, not, it's not how you breathe, guys. The Romans chapter 6 one, it ends with holiness. What does that give you? Less guilt, less remorse. Amen. If you have some semblance of holiness, there are just some things you're not going to do, and then you're going to wake up one morning and go, wow, I didn't realize how I ducked a bullet last night because I just stayed away from there. I went home. So you have less guilt and less remorse. Where does this list end? As remarkable that this list here is talking about our, 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 our earthly fellowship and relationship with each other, look what the fruit of this list is. Verse 8. For if these things be in you, there they are, chapter, chap, uh, verses 5, 6, and 7, all that from, from faith to charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, what are the things? The things that are just in this list, right? The checklist. If ye do these things... Ye shall never fall, for so, for for, so what? For so doing these things, virtue, knowledge, temperance, brotherly kindness, patience with man. For so an entrance shall, shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The end of one list is hope. The end of the other list is holiness. The end of the other list is heaven. I don't mean earning heaven. You, you got that with faith. You trusted Jesus Christ. You're not going to earn heaven, but everybody here is hoping to have some kind of a reward waiting for you when you get on the other side, correct? Correct? So how do you do it? Amen. How are you doing with the checklist? What did he say in 2 Corinthians 13? Examine yourselves. What you need to do sometime on your own is look at Romans chapter 5, that list, Romans chapter 6, that list, 2 Peter chapter 1, that list, and would, could you just be honest with yourself and say, you know what, this is just not in my life. This here is not here. I don't react that way. I got mad at God here. I have no patience with man here. I do this. I do that. It's not wrong to say you're wrong. Somebody once said it's not a sin to, stay, to, to be wrong. It's a sin to stay wrong. But if you're not going to admit that you're wrong, you can never get right. 
Isn't that true? And so guys, you need to read those checklists. Look, if somebody sends you one in the mail, how many hours do you read your Bible? How many people did you win last night? You can feel free to put that in your wood burner this summer, this winter and help start the fire. If man wrote the checklist, it's no good. But, but we are told to examine ourselves, which means there are checklists in the Bible. How do you check yourself out? How do you come out? How do you end up? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this book. Lord God, this book is more than just salvation. It is more than just condemnation for our sin or our foul behavior. This book is everything. This is the only book on this planet, God, that you authored. And we love this book. We all claim to love this book. And I pray, God, I thank you. I thank you for these at least three checklists in this Bible. There may be more that I've overlooked. But these are enough to keep us busy for the rest of our life. And so, Father, I pray that these people, they won't examine these checklists and then tap each other on the shoulder and tell each other how they're failing at the checklist. But they'll look in a mirror and tell that person how they're failing at one of these checklists. And that they'll begin to make the changes so that they can, they can check all of the proper boxes on your checklist and end up with hope and holiness in heaven. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. amen. All right, a lot to think about, amen? amen? And a lot to do something about. And um, You know, we could have an invitation, but I think God was working on every one of our hearts as we went through those lists. And uh, throughout the conference, as in any service, the altar's open. If God speaks to you halfway through the message, you want to come up and pray, you can come up and pray. But uh, I, I don't necessarily think that every service, every message has to be a life-changing experience. I don't think it all has to have a full altar. Uh, someone once said, some of us as Christians get our lives changed so much we don't even know who we are. So many times. Jack Wood used to say, Christ will deliver you from your yearly performance. And uh, God help us to take these things serious and have some depth and have some roots so that we will, what did Peter say? Never fall. Never fall. Folks, as we get closer to the Lord's return, how many of you understand that this ball called the world is getting bigger and bigger and rolling faster and faster as it gets down to the bottom of the hill. Uh, that world out there is getting worldlier by the moment and closing in. And if we don't take these matters serious that were presented to us here this morning, we won't stand. God help us this morning to take these matters serious, take them to heart and do something about it going forward from here. I'm sure God has spoken to every heart in some area as a result of this lesson this morning, and I hope we'll take it serious and go forward.